All right, uh, today's message is suckers for religion. Suckers for religion. Um, you'll hear that at the very end of the message. Really, it's a segue to next week. If you've been listening to the political campaign ads, whether on TV, video, radio, social media, otherwise, you've heard um, a lot and read dozens of, or listened to dozens of hours of political persuasions. And that's what they are. They're persuasive messages to try to get us to vote a particular way. And I've listened to probably more than the average person has because as I'm working, I'll, I'll plug a podcast in and have it playing over the speaker or wherever it is because I try, I try to fill my time with positive things. Um, maybe I shouldn't be listening to politics, but um, I do. But I haven't heard all the times I've been listening or watching or, or reading, I haven't heard one of the most important issues to me spoken of yet, and that is the United States need for the freedom from the British. Don't you guys agree that we have been under this tyrannical um, tyranny for far too long and we need to be set free from the British? I mean, are, aren't you guys tired of it? Am I the only one? I'm joking. Okay? I'm joking. Um, we all know where we stand with the, the kings over the pond. Our struggle with them is what we can now call ancient history, amen? My concern would have been a perfect uh, uh, conversation, say, in the middle of the 18th century, right? Where we were, if we were in the United States, still under British rule, it would be perfect for that time period and perfect for that audience. Why do I bring that up? Because history matters. History matters. An audience is very important. And context, context, context is key. We read our Bible, right? We read our Bible. It's a collection. It's a collection of ancient recordings. And if we read it without considering the history if we read it without considering the audience, i.e. who it was written to, and if we read it without context, it becomes a very slippery slope. Especially, we could end up applying things incorrectly. We might even miss the big overarching idea altogether if we read our Bible that way. So, history, audience, context are everything as we look back on the Old Testament law. When we read the Old Covenant or any of the passages from that Old Covenant, we need to realize history, audience, and context. My wife, since becoming a mother, which was early on in our marriage, has seen the first 15 minutes of every family movie that we've watched. You guys know what that means. Within... <laughs> Within the first 15 minutes, if we can get her to sit down and watch a family movie, she conks out immediately because that's the first time all day that she's got to sit down. Um, she would fall asleep breastfeeding all my children. I'd have to go wake her up, and then she'd have a horrible neck crook because she fell asleep with her head <laughs> laying to one side. I'm like, easy up when you raise your head. So again, she has seen the first 15 minutes of every movie. <laughs> Problem. She's never seen the endings, because they're all new if she ever, actually ever gets to see them. Now, imagine reading, uh, reading or watching a mystery, and you leave with the last five, ten minutes of an Alfred Hitchcock presentation. Now, I grew up watching Alfred Hitchcock, and if you miss the last five, ten minutes, you won't get it. You won't get it. Um, if you guys like reading a mystery novel, let's say you read the entire mystery novel except the last 30 pages, and then you close the book and say, good enough for me, and you set it down. What's happening? What's going to happen? Well, you're going to miss something. Miss what? The surprise ending. The surprise ending. And once you 
read or watch the surprise ending, <clears throat> you have to re-question everything that you've assumed from the beginning until that surprise ending. Because once you get to the surprise ending, everything makes sense. Oh, that's why so-and-so, and that's why this happened. And all of a sudden, all the pieces come together, and you're like, man, they had me going down the complete wrong path. If it's a good mystery novel or whatever it is, a, a, a type of a motion picture that has that, that surprise ending is key for us understanding everything we previously read. We have to finish it because that surprise ending makes us go back and reevaluate everything we have previously assumed to be true. Now, why did I bring that up? Because it's exactly how you and I need to read our Bible. See, there's a surprise ending in the New Covenant. The surprise ending is that Jesus Christ fulfills the law. Surprise ending. And because he's fulfilled the law, we have to now recon reconceive everything we've read in the Old Covenant based on the fact that Jesus Christ has came and fulfilled the law. We see the old in light of the new. I like to say we need to read the old with your new covenant lenses. John, this is for you. We need to read the old covenant with our new covenant lenses. Because if we don't put our new covenant lenses on, we forget the surprise ending. We forget how we need to now understand the old in light of the new. Only then are we teaching the old in the way God intends it to be taught, a covenant that is now obsolete. Hebrews 8.13 says this, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. If we don't read the old in light of the new, we think that the old is the new, and we try to live the old. We teach the old, we preach the old, we try to live our lives by the old. And God says, something new has come, the old is to vanish away. 2 Corinthians 3.10 reiterates it. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. There was a glory in the new covenant that excelleth the glory that was in the old. And the old was great. I mean, the law was God. The law, the law is the character of God. It's, it's, the, it's, it's a wonderful thing, but he said there is something coming that is even more glorious, something that excels greater than the old, so much so that the old will vanish away, it will become obsolete, and we need to focus on the new. Focus on the new. Not too long ago... Um, my sister's family went together and bought my sister one of those DNA ancestry tests. It was 23andMe. Okay? You guys have seen the 23andMe advertisements before. I think something bad just happened. There. I don't know what it was, bankruptcy or something. Um, the question I posed this morning is, are you Jewish? Are you Jewish? Do you have Jewish in your bloodline? If you if you are not, then you are what we call a Gentile. The Bible, uh, God always considered two groups of people, um, Jews and Gentiles. Those were the two, two groups of people that oftentimes God divided um, in our Bible, Jews and Gentiles. So I asked the question, are you Jewish by blood? Why do I bring this up? Because the law was never given to the Gentiles. Now, I only know one person in our midst that has a little tinge of Jewish in them. Um, I won't disclose that in case he didn't. Okay, well, already nailed it down to guys, right? So ladies, you're out. But think about that. The law was never given to the Gentiles, and I'm a Gentile. To my knowledge, and according to my sister's report, which I'm from the same lineage, we have no Jewish in our blood whatsoever. So the law was never given to the Gentiles. It was only given to the Jews. 
the law set Jews apart from everyone else that was on planet Earth. Everyone else was excluded from the citizenship of Israel and the covenant. Now, I know later on we read that um, you could become a Jew by marriage because we read about that in our Bible, how some Israelites indeed uh, did marry outside, but that person immediately had to convert to Judaism or they couldn't marry. Some slaves became Jews um, through conversion as well. But the law separated the Jews from the Gentiles. Even those that were converted no longer considered themselves Gentiles. They were Jews because they followed the law and were now part of the covenant. So keep that in mind. I'm a Gentile. The law was never made for us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, that at that time we were without Christ, this is talking about us Gentiles, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, see we weren't citizens, we were from the outside looking in, and strangers from the covenants of promise. We had no hope, and we were without God in the world. The Gentiles were worshiping pagan gods, multiple pagan gods. Uh, doing all kinds of things that broke every law that the Jews were trying to keep. Um, we were certainly without hope, trying to find our way in the dark. We had no idea who Moses was. We had no idea the ten things that he chiseled into or God chiseled into the stone. If someone started telling us about this guy named Moses with a white beard, we would literally say, Moses who? Never heard of the guy. Got a picture? Uh, you know, is he on TV? Can I read about him somewhere? I mean, we had no idea who he was because it wasn't for us. It was intended for the Jews. This abandoning the law and adopting God's new way was a big, huge challenge for the Jews. Imagine growing up as a little Jew your whole life being taught the Torah and the law by mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. And as you grew up, you went through all the rituals. You went to the temple. You saw all the sacrifices. You went through all the rituals. You literally grew up with 613 laws on you all day long. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes along and says, forget all that. Here's something more glorious. Forget the law. Trust in Christ. It was a big deal, a big challenge for the Jews. Hebrews records thousands of words, okay, audience. Who's Hebrews written to? Hebrews. Okay? Um, Hebrews has thousands and thousands of words in the book telling the Jews to leave the old and cling to the new. Depart from the old and cling to the new. And that was hard for them when they grew up with what you and I would call a culture, a tradition. Because it's all they knew. But God is telling them in the book of Hebrews, leave it, leave it and cling to the new. Most of us, for most of us Gentiles, this is not a problem. We were never offered the law. We were only, have only been offered one singular covenant, and that is the new covenant. Breaking free from the old shouldn't be necessarily a difficulty as it was never ours to begin with. It's almost easier for a non-Christian, someone who's never experienced Christianity under the law, which many of us have, we grew up in any of the mainline churches. Um, they are definitely teaching the law. Uh, my background as a fundamental Baptist, definitely teaching the law. It's almost easier for those of us who've never heard that taught to come to Christ and not be under the bondage of what we now know as the law. It's quite enlightening to think our heritage, i.e., I'm not a Jew, neither are most of you, our heritage, 
just like the Greeks of the time of the Bible when it was written, the Greeks are just like us. They did not know Moses. They did not know any of the laws of the Jewish people unless they bartered with them and traded with them. They didn't know Moses from a hole in the ground. That's a good thing in many, many ways. They never heard of that bearded guy. In fact, when the law was brought in, Paul got mad. When he preached to the Greeks, people that had never heard it before, and we can read about it in our Bibles, he actually got upset because oftentimes when, when Paul went in and preached to certain groups of people, he would say, all right, awesome, you got Jesus. Keep things going here. I'll be back to visit you again. And he was off to the next town, the next city to preach again. <laughs> Guess who oftentimes was following Paul? They weren't with him, but they were following behind him. And it upset him greatly because somebody he called the Judaizers would follow him into these cities and then tell these brand new Christians who were living in Jesus with total freedom, hey, we're really happy that you got saved with Jesus. That's awesome. But if you really want to be a super Christian, it's time to get circumcised. It's time to do this. It's time to do that. And all of a sudden, these people who were living free in Jesus were now underneath the law. They were being told, don't do this and don't do that and do do this and do do that. And that's what it is. It's the do do gospel. And it doesn't get you anywhere. Jesus did it all. And when, we, when we're stuck and put back underneath that law, all of a sudden, it's no longer grace. And it upset Paul because he'd circle back around or he'd hear of someone teaching a different formula than what he had taught at the forefront, which was Jesus plus nothing. It's Jesus plus nothing. Don't add to Jesus because then it's no longer Jesus. It's Jesus plus something else. Just like if I had 100% pure water and I put one granule of rat poisoning in here, just one little, one little dot of it, one little powder flake, it's no longer 100% pure water. And that's what was happening. The Judaizers are coming in and these people got saved and it's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And they walk in and say, wait, there's more. There's more to this Christianity than you've heard of. We're happy to tell you how you can be even a better Christian than you are right now. And they changed the formula to Jesus plus something. And unfortunately, we still hear the same today. Jesus for salvation and law for daily living. Now, if you walk into any evangelical church on a Sunday morning... You will hear them say that. Most of them will say that. I'm not saying all of them. But most of them will say, yes, absolutely. You cannot earn your salvation. You can't do it by good works. You can't do it from abstaining from evil. You are only saved by grace through faith alone. That's it. Most evangelicals will agree that is the only way that you can get saved is by faith through grace alone. But after you get saved, that's when you got to button up your buttons. That's when you got to pull your bootstraps up. It's now it's up to you to be a good Christian. So now the law comes back in for our day to live. You want to be a good Christian, right? Don't you? Don't you want to be a good worker for Jesus? Be in God's army? Well, this is what you need to do. And they break out the list for us. That's what you hear every Sunday morning. Do this, don't do that. Be a better Christian. Do it for Jesus. Do it for God. Do it for yourself and others around you. But the truth for us Gentiles is that we were never offered the law. We were never offered the law. For us, it is the new covenant or nothing at all. That's it. We are new covenant believers. 
We're not old and new covenant believers. We are new covenant believers who have read the surprise ending. We know the surprise ending. The surprise ending is living inside of us. And because of that, we need to view everything in the old through the lens of the new. Now, making a statement, making a statement from this lectern this morning that rules and the law, and especially the Ten Commandments, have nothing to do with the Christian life can come off as a radical statement. And I am pretty certain that I've had people leave this fellowship because I've made those statements. And that's okay. And many Christians I meet and converse with are still undecided on the role of the law in their lives. Let's try this checklist real quick, and I want you to check all that apply. Christians should look, Christians should look to the law for salvation. Christians should look to the law as a moral compass. Christians should look to the law to help them define what sin is. Christians should look to the law for growth in Christ. Christians should look to the law for none of the above. I almost wanted to print it out and have you guys take this before I said it. Because if you would have met me a little while ago, I might have had more than one check mark on this list. Apparently, we don't need the law for dealing with sin or for living uprightly. If we need the law to define sin, then you guys better get a long list out because the law defines 613 of them. Okay, that's just what the law defined. And then the Pharisees went on to write a lot more than that. Thousands of them. And I've shared some of them with you. I've got to talk to modern day Jews. Right down to. You're not allowed to. Tear. Pull a paper. On the Sabbath. So you know you're in your bathroom. I don't know how many sheets you use. Um, let's say you pull the roll down. And that tear. That's work on the Sabbath. You can't do that. So usually it's the kids' jobs on Thursday. To grab the toilet paper roll and tear off squares and have them in stacks next to each toilet in the bathroom. So on Sabbath, when the Jew has to go to the bathroom, the work's already been done. All I have to do is pick it up and wipe, and off they go. I don't know if they're allowed to flush it. I hope so. The rich ones actually hire someone, a Gentile, to come in and do it for them. All the work, cleaning, cooking, all that stuff is done throughout the Sabbath on the weekends by someone who gets paid, the rich ones. Should we look to the law for these things? No one can have ham bowls for lunch today. It's one of the things my wife made. We're going to eat in a little bit. Because that's pork. Sorry, Charlotte, can't have pork or any pork products or anything that's been touched with pork. Dan, I'm sorry, you can't mow your lawn on Saturday. That's part of the Sabbath. You have to figure out another time to do it. Can't check Friday night emails, Lori. That's when Sabbath starts. Got to get that done before sunset. Remember that Sabbath, that's one of the big ten. Shall we just then pick a few laws that we think are the most important and make that our moral compass. And all of a sudden we begin to pick and choose which ones we want to use as our guide to help make us more godly. There's two groups we can fall into. The law or select portion shall be used as a guide to help us stay moral or keep us moral or make us grow more. Or the other group says that Christians should have no part with the law 
after salvation? <laughs> Which one are you? Because both cannot be right. Either we're putting a check mark here for none of the above, or we're putting a check mark for everything. Because you can't be both. Both can't be right. Both cannot be biblical, even though there are people preaching this morning saying it's so. And many, many Christians trying to do that balancing act. To make the law a Christian moral code would be to rewrite the scriptures we just read and add for salvation to every single verse. We must believe, and there's, there's some references that I want that in. This is our checklist. First one's easy. Many passages tell us the law doesn't make us right. We know that. Um, we know we've entered Christ by faith, and Acts and Romans and Galatians tells us that verbatim. You cannot be saved by works. It's by grace through faith alone. What must we believe then? Well, Galatians 3.24 says this. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by good works. Is that what it says? By the Ten Commandments. Is that what it says? By going to church. No, it says by faith. So as Christians, as, as New Covenant believers, this is what we must believe about the law. This is a little way of review. We must believe that we were dead to the law. We are now dead to the law. We're not under the law, Romans 6.14. We're free from the law, Romans 6.7. We are no longer supervised by the law. Galatians 3.25, we don't serve in the old way of the law, Romans 7.6. We can live in the newness and freedom of the Spirit. That's what happened to the Greeks when they got saved. That's what happened to you the moment you got saved. I can now not live under the law, but now I can live under the freedom and newness of the Holy Spirit that's within me. The Holy Spirit's my God. But when we teach people, you, you got to come to salvation by grace alone, but then for your daily living, you got to start following the law. Well, you need the law, otherwise you don't know what sin is. Well, you need the law, or, or you won't know how to fill in the blanks. And all of a sudden, these two groups emerge. I was part of the first group for the first half of my life. Until I heard grace taught correctly. And here I was living in freedom of Christ until I sinned. And then as soon as I sinned, the condemnation of the law came down on me. And I had to fess up um, to get right with God. I had to balance out my Christian karma. I, had, uh, I felt compelled to then go out and do more good works and good deeds Tell someone about Jesus, go help an old lady across the street, you name it. Whatever I could do to get back in the graces of God, because that law was telling me you messed up and you're a failure, and God's not liking what who you are at this point in time. Fix it. Both cannot be right. Both cannot be right. To make the law a Christian war code will be to rewrite these scriptures we just read and add for salvation to every single one of them. Let's try it out. We are dead to the law for salvation. This is what we'd have to do to rewrite the Bible. We are not under the law for salvation. We are free from the law for salvation. We're not supervised by the law for salvation. We don't serve the old way of the law for salvation. We'd have to rewrite the Bible. We'd have to add to the Bible. Revelation says, woe to those who subtract and add to the Bible. 
Because you're taking God's holy word and you're changing it. I don't want to change it. Paul didn't want to change. Leave it the way it is. Read it in the simplicity that God intended it to be read. Why do we add it? Why do we say, for salvation, grace alone, but for everything else, for all the moral living, we have to add the law to it? Most of the time, I think, I think it's because pastors, theologians are fearful. Fearful of what might happen if we tell people not to follow the law. You're going to have a whole bunch of rabid, naked Christians freaking out in the street. It'll be an absolute chaos. That's what they think will happen. So we've got to keep them under the law to allow some control so we don't lose them. It'll be a total debauchery. It's a fear. Ultimately, it's a fear and a lack of confidence in the indwelling Christ to keep his children upright. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit is strong enough, powerful enough to keep people upright and thinking correctly and behaving correctly and the right attitude. I don't think the Holy Spirit's strong enough. So let's quick make some lists up. Jesus told the Hebrews, forget the old, clean to the new. And the new is, Jesus fulfilled the law so that we don't have to. But the phrase for salvation isn't there. It's not there in any of the verses here. We are dead to the law, plain and simple. We're not supervised by the law, plain and simple. We're not under the law, plain and simple. We don't serve in the old way, plain and simple. It's straightforward. Paul wasn't watering down the passages in any way. He was building up the power of the Holy Spirit. Plain and simple, the law is not a compass. The law is not a guide or help towards Spiritual growth for Christians. Galatians 5.18 But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. What's leading you today, brothers and sisters? Is it some tradition you were taught? Is it something you were taught from a pulpit? Someone that you trusted and believed in? Well, they, it must be right. I haven't heard it just from one minister. I've heard it from dozens. And my radio pastor, my TV pastor says the same thing. So it must be right. If ye be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Many of you have heard of the Barna Group. Barna Group is a conservative Christian polling, surveying place. One of the recent surveys had this to say about Christians belief about what Christian maturity is, right? If I line 10 of you up here and we did a secret ballot in the back and said, all right, rate the 10 people up here on a scale of 1 to 10, which one's most mature, 10 being the most mature? How would you rate them? That's what the Barna Group asked people. You know, what, what does it mean to be mature in Christianity? I want to read you this. Most Christians equate spiritual maturity with following the rules. One of the widely embraced notions about spiritual health isn't, is that it means trying hard to follow the rules described in the Bible. 81% of confessing evangelical Christians endorse the statement. If you want to be a mature Christian, you are following the rules. Depends where you go. Part your hair on the right side. Hair's not too not too long for the guys, not too short for the ladies. 
The dresses aren't too long, they're not too short. Pants are for men. Bible should be carried underneath the right arm only. And on and on the list goes. Maturity for Christians is following the rules. Isn't that kind of scary? For those of us who were never given the law, we've made it into what it looks like. Are following the rules what spiritual maturity is all about? Galatians 3.1 Paul said this, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Paul had to fix many of the new churches. Somebody came back and told you something that I never told you. I told you that it's Jesus alone. What are you doing? Why are you following this and doing that? Do I have this one in here? Galatians 3.21 says this, is the law then against the promises of God, God forbid? For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. If there was a way for you to live godly, we would have done it underneath the law and Christ wouldn't have had to die on the cross. Does that make sense? So we got Christians today who believe in Jesus for salvation, but not in Jesus for daily living. Because I've been taught that we don't have much confidence in the Holy Spirit to lead a Christian to do what Christians do. So we're going to teach the law and keep you guys in order. And Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross if that was the case. Are following the rules what spiritual maturity is all about? I don't think so. Romans 7, 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. See, we were baptized in the body of Christ. That ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. The only way we bring forth mature fruit to God is being buried with Jesus Christ, raised to newness of life, and living in his power, in his newness. That's the only way we can bring forth fruit unto God. It's not by following the rules. It's not by putting ourselves under the law. In fact, in verse 4 here in Romans 7, Paul literally calls it spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery, we, we've left our, our husband Jesus, and we're going back and flirting with Moses, our ex. Don't commit spiritual adultery. Stick with Jesus. He's so much better than Moses. So much better. He even confronts the Colossians on the do nots, because they go back too. And the Colossians weren't, weren't Jews, they were Greeks, they were Gentiles, just like you and me. Look what, he, look what Paul says to them. Colossians chapter 2, verses 21 and 23. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Someone came and taught them this. Because again, they didn't have the law. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body this, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. It's all they are. It's a fleshly practice to live from the law. And there are a lot of self-righteous people out there that feel pretty good about themselves because they've been living the good life. I haven't been to a rated R movie. I haven't cursed. I haven't done this, I haven't done that, I have done this, I have done that. And then they look down at everyone else who haven't seen you in a while. Where have you been on Sunday mornings? Heard you yelling at your kid in the supermarket the other day. 
wasn't very Christian-like. I saw you in your bikini out mowing the grass. Now, I didn't look, but I was told, because I don't look at that stuff. And all of a sudden, the law is guiding people's morality instead of man's own spirit. Paul warned them of the futility of trying to improve themselves by rules. Recall again the Colossians are Gentiles, just like us. Why would any Gentile look to the law as their guide to daily living? It's an absurdity. I want you guys to remember that word. The next time you try to guide yourself to moral living by following another law, say, I am living in absurdity. I have the spirit of Jesus Christ inside of me. And here I am trying to be more mature by following a rule that God told me I'm not under it. I'm not led by it anymore. I'm led by the Spirit. God, I have full confidence in you this morning that you will show me what is right and what is wrong, what is holy and what is unholy. I will look to your finished work on the cross, not only for my salvation, but for my daily living as well. Thank you for guiding me. Thank you for putting within me a, a a God positioning system, GPS, that will take me where I need to go, will have me say what I need to say, have me keep my mouth shut when I need to keep my mouth shut. I don't need to follow rules because I'm not under them anymore. It's an absurdity why we would look to them as a daily guide. Why did Paul even have to warn the Colossians of the dangers of returning to the law. Because addiction to the law, addiction to law-based religion, is not just a Jewish problem. So remember, the Jews grew up with it, and then they're told as an adult, forget everything that you've been practicing for the last 50 years. Try this, do this. Addiction to religion Religious-based living is not just a Jewish problem. It's personal. We humans are suckers for religion. Come next week and you'll find out what that is. Why are we drawn to it? Why do we feel the need to put ourselves underneath those things? Well, we're going to go right into our communion. I'm going to ask 